The most important thing that SQL Server does other than store our data is allow us to query it. Understanding how to query that data is essential. So today we're going to look at the Query Optimizer, the same Query Optimizer that manages all versions of SQL Server, Azure SQL, SQL MI, today on Tales from the Field. Wake up, today's gonna be a good day. 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 Wake up. It's going to be a good day. If this is your first time finding your way over to Tales from the Field, give us a like and give us a subscribe. We drop content every Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. On Monday, we have our MS Tech Bits. On Tuesday, we have our Azure Data Community Roundtable, where we feature content from the creators in the Azure Data Community for the Azure Data Community. Then on Wednesdays, we have another MS Tech Bits. That's a video where we find inspiration from you, the community, working with a product group or a customer, and then we share it with you. Today's Monday and it's an MS Tech Bits. So let's get over that great content. All right, so first let's talk about the way that things are actually processed in SQL Server. When we write a query, we typically write a query like this. We say, select top distinct from a table. We join and we have an on condition for our join. We have a where predicate value, a group by, a cube, a roll up, or even an order by. But that's not how SQL Server reads things. SQL Server says, oh, we have a from. Uh, from where do I get my data? What table am I actually getting my table? That makes sense, right? I've got to evaluate the table first. Then is there any on conditions? Because the ons are going to show how we actually join our tables together, which makes sense because the next thing we do is we look at the join tables. Then we look at the where predicate values because these are the filters telling us which rows will be coming back. If we have to do a group by, we look at the group bys at this point in time. We have a cube, a roll up, having, select, distinct order by, then finally at the bottom top. You may go, but Brad, top one returns so quickly. Uh, yes, it still runs the entire statement behind the scenes, but it shortcuts the return process and it only has to return that one row to you. So if I do a top one, seems really quick, but I'm still churning the underlying subsystem. So when we look at the query process, first we parse, we bind, we optimize, then we execute. Let's step into this a little more. So when we parse, we validate the syntax, right? We, no executing a table, no selecting from a store procedure unless I've done some really funky things with dynamic SQL. Parsing makes sure that our syntax is correct. Then we bind. We do name resolution. We make sure that the table actually exists, right? If I mistype the name of the table, what does it do? It gives me a little error. Type derivation, uh, I make sure that the types actually match in case I'm casting something. Aggregate binding, if I'm doing some type of aggregate, I need to do a make sure I can do that. I could do a count of email addresses, but I can't do a sum of email addresses. So got to make sure that my, my aggregate binding is correct. And then my group binding. We've all had that instance where I didn't put a column uh, into the group by statement, but I had it in my select column and we hit execute and it immediately comes back with that nice little red error. Well, that's because we did group binding. And again, parse and bind, they happen really quickly. And their job is to make sure that we don't spend a lot of time in optimization with things that we shouldn't. Because optimization is next. And we start with optimization with input trees. And then simplification, deriving cardinality and join orders, trivial plan, and then exploration. So let's start with our input trees. So this is an undocumented trace flag. And let's say I have a table where I've got different students and I say select last name, first name, count from this student. Uh, and I'm going to put in this query trace flag. And what it will do is it will actually give me the tree. What I'm going to find is the first thing that happens is I'm going to have a get from my tables. I'm going to do an on condition that leads to my join. I'm then going to do my select. I do my group by aggregates and I project out. And if I were to turn this sideways, the interesting thing is it looks like a query execution plan. Makes a lot of sense. But these input trees, I will actually make thousands potentially of trees trying to find the best one. Now, remember, we are a least cost optimizer. And the least cost optimizer means the lowest plan wins. We're trying to get the lowest score so it's easiest for us to be able to output this. 
we go into simplification. Simplification does some really, really cool things. So simplification does constant folding. It evaluates expressions during optimization, so that way it can produce a constant if we need it. Domain simplification, predicate pushdown, join simplification, contradiction detection. Um, all of these things prevent unnecessary IOs. Join simplification removes tables that we don't need. Predicate pushdown eliminates rows up front by reordering our predicate values. And domain simplification. Uh, this is a thank you from the SQL developers. We don't have to do anything for it. It's just automatically there. Next up is derive cardinality join orders. So one thing about this real quick. This is really important to understand. This really depends on statistics. And keep in mind that we had some changes. We got a new cardinality estimator in SQL Server 2014. Then we got some changes to, to statistics in SQL Server 2016. So it uses statistics. It gets the number of rows in tables, so it's able to guess the number of rows per table from a logical tree. And it's used to, in, uh, to understand join type. The more complex a query or its expression, the more difficult it is to provide a good cardinality expression. Some things that can get in the way of deriving cardinality are scalar functions, views, table value functions, common table expressions. So for SQL Server 2014 and below, these are some of the statistic things to keep in mind. The way that auto update statistics worked was 20% of the base table plus 500 rows had to be updated. Not bad for small tables, but if you have very large databases, and a lot of us do, this could be quite bad for you. So for example, if we had 100,000 rows, that meant 20,500 rows needed to be updated before we get a statistics update. Okay, not bad, but not great. Um, a million rows, we're looking at 200,500 rows. 10 million rows, now we're looking at 2 million rows, 500. 50 million. 10 million, 500. You kind of get the picture, right? Many of us have rows and tables where we've got billions of rows. That's not going to work out so well for us. So a change we made was, oh, and something to keep in mind, filtered indexes require the same base table update as non-clustered indexes. So filtering an index doesn't make it any easier for you. So for 2016 and above, and keep in mind, you have to be on DB compatibility 130 or higher. We need auto update statistics also to be on. But what happens is now it's the old algorithm, 500 rows plus 20%, or the square root of 1,000 rows times the number of rows that we have in the table, whichever is less. So for example, if I've got 100,000 rows, remember that was 20,500. Well, now with the new algorithm, it's down to 10,000. 4 million rows, 31,622. Not great, but a lot better than 200,000. 10 million rows, 2,500,000 down to 100,000. And for 50 million rows, 10,500,000 rows down to 223,606 rows. That's a really big improvement. So now we start to get to Trivial Plan. Trivial Plan, this is the simplest part of optimization. Only applies to logical trees that have an obvious best execution plan. Things like select star from table A. But there's only one way we're going to solve this. We're going to do a ta full table scan. Some things that can prevent trivial plans are things like joins, subqueries, inequality predicates. That doesn't mean they're bad. That just means that if we make the query complex, we're going to leave the trivial plan space. That's OK. That's fine. Sometimes I need joins. Sometimes I need subqueries. Sometimes I need inequality predicates. The next phase after trivial plan is exploration. Search zero, transaction processing, simple joints, not a lot of rows to return, typically with a query execution cost of less than 0 0.2. Search one, quick plan, also known as complex query one. We evaluate more things. Theoretically, we could look at parallelism being introduced. And if the best cost plan is greater than one and the serial plan is less than the cost threshold for parallelism, we generate our first parallel plan. Search two. This is full optimization. We are throwing the kitchen sink at things. We are trying to do everything to make sure that this actually runs. So that looked pretty simple, right? Well, it actually even gets more complex than that. Underneath the covers, we're parsing, we're algebraizing, we're expanding views, we're doing NNF convert, simplification, auto stats create and update. Uh, remember, if you ever have a statistic that's automatically created because you did something to a column, this is it. 
cardinality derivation, heuristic join reordering. Heuristics is just a fancy word that means guessing with an algorithm, but that's what it does. It guesses and it looks at the algorithms and it, it with an algorithm and it basically says, let me see if I can find the best joins. Project normalization, trivial plan, exploration, copy out, and then we convert to an executable tree. Now, when we get to execution, the physical plan is created, the memo is populated, the plan cache is also populated, and the, the interaction with the storage engine begins. But this is very important to remember because when we are able to skip optimization, we're able to go directly to the plan cache, get the query, and execute. If you've ever run a query once in SQL Server and then run it a second time and you went, wow, that's a lot faster, that's what happened. You went to the plan cache, you skipped all of optimization, and you were able to execute the query immediately. Also, the logical data is no longer in disk. It's been loaded into memory, and memory is a lot faster than loading things into physical disk. So both of those things potentially together. So I'm over in SQL Server, and the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the demo from the slide deck. I'm going to use my college database. I'm going to turn on deep trace flag 3604. What this does is this prints things out to the message window. Otherwise, when I run my next trace flag, it wouldn't show me anything. So I'm going to run 3604. And then I'm going to run this query. Select last name grade count for students. Paul Whedon, where you have an F, uh, max stop one. I'm going to recompile this. But the big thing is the query trace flag. This is going to get the output of the query. And there were 448 students. And you can see this. Let me make this a little bit bigger. This is our tree. You can see I got a get for my tables. I've got my get for my student, my grades. I've got an on condition. That's my join. Uh, here's my select. And I've got a project out, my group by advocate. You can see. Um, here's the values that I'm looking at. And essentially, this is our algebraized tree. So again, interesting way for me to be able to get this and look at it. But if I run this one more time, and this time, let me turn on my actual execution plan. You can see, I get my tables, I come back in, and I project out. So I'm going to go use my AdventureWorks 2022 database. And one of the things I wanted to tell you, I told you that um, we expand views as a phase. So one of the interesting things is we've got this DMV, SysDM Exec Query Optimizer Info. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to run this. And I'm going to get a counter. And in here, I'm going to write a CTE. And this is to let you know um, that the CTE, as you can see, is expanded as a view. And so if I run this, you can see over and over again, my view counter is continuing to increment. So every time I hit a CTE, I'm essentially using a view. So what about derived queries? Because you may say, well, what's the solution? Um, let's say I don't want to use view expansion. I can use a derived query. A derived query is where I do a select statement, but the select statement um, is derived as a table where I say select. You can see star from production.product where name like this. And then I can put a select statement around this. I can alias it as a table. You can see derived not a view. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to run this over and over again with the same counter. And you can see it never increments because a derived table is not a view. And so if I want to skip view expansion, it's important to understand how. Now, why would I want to skip view expansion? Well, because sometimes the optimizer can only see so far into views. And there's a lot of people and customers I've worked with over the years that have views, referencing views, referencing views. And after a period of time, their queries start to slow down and they wonder why. Well, it's because of view expansion. And remember, we're a least cost optimizer. And after a period of time, the optimizer starts to guess at the statistics. It can't see the statistics for the underlying table. Now, it used to only guess one, and that's on the previous cardinality estimator. On the new cardinality estimator, it's actually a multiplication of statistics to be able to figure out something other than one. 
But if you have thousands and thousands of rows, it's not going to come close. And it's still guessing. So when I talk to customers and they go, how do I get away from views, referencing views, referencing views? I reference the base table and I use it doing a derived query. Now, views aren't bad. Typically, if I go four levels deep, I'm fine. But it's an important thing for us to keep in mind. All right, so next up, let's look at simplification. I told you that simplification would simplify these queries. So I'm going to run this real quick. I've got select P name from production.product where P name like substring left char ASCII to char character. You know, I don't typically write queries like this, but you know who might in Hibernate. I have seen in Hibernate queries that were written like this. And when I come over here, if I turn on my actual execution plan, I can see that what it did was it took this and it said where value like D because that's what char ASCII six blah, blah, blah is. So constant folding, taking something that's very, very complex and making it simple. The optimizer does this by default. So what about domain simplification? Here we go. Select top 10 production uh, from production.product, where it's between 300 and 400, or 200, 500, or 400 and 600. You know, I think I've overlapped some there. And as a matter of fact, if I execute this, I can see there's a top one. And it, prevented, it protected me from doing too much. How about join simplification? I've got uh, select TH production ID, sum TH actual cost from production.transaction history, joined by production.product, where product ID equals TH production ID. You know, I group by TH product ID. I don't think I'm actually using production.product in here. And sure enough, I'm not. And as a matter of fact, the optimizer makes sure that we don't join that table unnecessarily. We just go to that one specific table. Well, what if I've got something super complex like a CTE that's got view expansion, right? Like I'm pulling in all these different columns, but all I really need is product ID and product name from this complex view. If I execute this, what I can see is I did an index seek going directly to that non-clustered index. Really, really cool stuff. And real quick, just in case you want to, here's another example, DBCC trace on 3604. DBCC show on rules. This is going to give you every rule that's actually there within the optimizer. Not that you're expected to know these. Don't worry about these. There are algorithms behind the scenes associated with each of these. And then DBCC show off rules. There should be no off rules. Do not ever turn off any rules. If you do, you could really muck up the query optimizer. But if you were to turn them off, this would show them. And then if you wanted to be able to see all of them together, you could select from SysDM exec query transformation stats, and you can see there's all these great names uh, with the promise, the promise average, the build, the substitute. So what did we cover? Well, we covered a lot. We talked about the query optimizer and basically the entire process that a query goes through when it enters SQL to be able to go through optimization. We showed a couple demos to correspond with that. Remember, there's a lot of concepts that we can use this to build upon. And so there's more that we'll cover from here. You know where we like to keep this going? Sound off down in the comments. Did you like what you see? Any questions? Uh, we would love to hear from you. Thank you so much for joining us on Tales from the Field. Take care of one another. Goodbye, everybody. Today's gonna be a good day. Set your affirmations, aspirations I got shit to do, the 